Hey friends from the future, if you're curious about Tinkerbell, you're in the right place. We're going to be talking with Dan, who's been working on Tinkerbell for a while and wrestling with provisioning bare metal for even longer. If questions arise as you're watching, or if you'd like to experiment or contribute, head over to tinkerbell.org, where in addition to the docs, there's links to the other places where we hang out, GitHub, Slack, and Twitter. So Dan, Tinkerbell, where did it start? What's it for? I mean, Tinkerbell is a project that was announced in uh, February timeframe, I think. Um, uh, and Tinkerbell is essentially uh, the result of a lot of work that happened within um, uh, Equinix Metal, formerly known as Packets, um, where, you know, kind of their years of experience of uh, bare metal deployments uh, ultimately has resulted in the, the Tinkerbell project. Um, so, you know, I'm going to be kind of covering uh, a lot about that and we'll have more sessions probably uh, after this, but, um, you know, kind of the, the short story really is that Tinkerbell is a bare metal provisioning platform, um, all based around kind of cloud native concepts. So it's all based on, you know, kind of using Docker containers. It's all uh, API driven, um, with with a plan of kind of you know building it into other ecosystem tooling and things like that yeah um seems a, the for on the bare metal side seems a little bit more difficult than just um give me some make an api call give me some compute resource the, the cloud version um and then uh, yeah if you can go through the pieces that are or why is it hard yeah so i'm i mean i'm gonna go through this in, in a little bit but um it's kind of kind of amusing being part of kind of things like the Kubernetes ecosystem and uh, and whatnot. Um, meeting people who've never really kind of done any sort of bare metal deployments and things like that. So some of the technologies that you know we're going to kind of touch on today and and things like that. Um, a lot of people are perhaps taken for granted to a certain degree in that they are happening, uh, but they've never really had to deal with them. Um, a lot of people these days are so used to uh, either using a UI or some CLI tooling or even through APIs, basically just requesting some resource uh, and being given some virtual machines or just some infrastructure or, or a platform to make use of. Um, what we're really gonna be covering uh, and what Tinkerbell really does is allow uh, people to actually do those sorts of things themselves. Um, if you have physical servers and uh, you want to kind of start to move towards a more cloud-like environment, cloud-like experience where you know as you would do with things like aws and google cloud you know hit them up ask uh, request resource and get that resource back you know the, the ideas really behind tinkerbell moving forward are being able to do the same sorts of things with with bare metal um and uh, you, you know tinkerbell kind of came out of the requirements uh that packet had in order to automate bare metal infrastructure um but you know as we'll see um doing it yourself at the moment is still a, quite a, an exhaustive task there are a lot of components that are required um automating of doing these sorts of things yourself uh introduce technical debt quite quickly um and even the technologies that we use in order for the these sorts of provisioning tasks um are, are generally kind of quite dated um they do the job well uh, but they've not really been looked at for quite some time. So, um, yeah, as I say, well, we can go through this um, as part of today's session. Yeah, perfect. Uh, yeah, that, that'd be a great time to fire it up. And I think we have an intro to uh, yeah. bare metal and Tinkerbell there. Excellent. So I will uh, share my screen and uh, kick off this session. Excellent. Um, so um, intros, um, which I completely forgot to do. Uh, my name is Dan Finneran. Um, I uh, joined uh, Equinex Metal uh, around three months or so ago. Um, my background is Kubernetes containers, bare metal, uh, and the automation of those sorts of things. So. Um, I've had kind of experience in building platforms to automate the deployment of bare metal servers all the way up to kind of getting platforms deployed on top of. Um, 
which, uh, you know, is kind of one of the reasons I'm here. Um, I, you know, kind of really enjoy doing these sorts of things. Um, uh, and part of my focus is on uh, Tinkerbell, which we'll cover in a little bit more detail uh, later on. Excellent. Um, the first thing, the first thing I notice on this uh, particular slide is that there's the, the it seems to be the, the very largest and the very smallest. There's a Raspberry Pi that's I think maybe thirty to forty dollars US, and on the <laughs> other side there's uh, looks like very very tall server racks that are probably uh, one of those is probably what maybe a quarter million dollars worth of uh, worth of hardware in each of them. Uh, so Tinkerbell good for both of those or? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think, you know, kind of this to a certain degree kind of comes out of the 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 current um, kind of, there's a lot of people kind of talking, there's more and more people talking about bare metal at the moment. Um, but I guess uh, this leads on quite nicely into uh, what is bare metal? Um, um, bare metal can be a Raspberry Pi. Bare metal can be... Um, a very large, expensive piece of uh, server equipment. Uh, one thing that bare metal is not is it's not a rock band fronted by a giant red bear. Um, <laughs> so, you know, kind of <laughs> what is not bare metal is this. What is bare metal um, is essentially physical hardware, so a, a physical server. Um, and typically when we say bare metal, um, it is basically being able to directly access the hardware uh, with, with nothing uh, between yourself and the physical chips, the physical uh, devices that are plugged into that server. Um, so yeah, exactly. When we're talking about bare metal is where we're not talking about things like virtual machines. Uh, we're not talking about things like serverless. Um, we are talking about a physical box somewhere, whether that physical box is a Raspberry Pi or whether that physical box is a multi-million dollar server. Um, bare metal basically is something that's tangible. Um, and uh, then the next kind of things really are, you know, kind of automating and, and making how, how to bear best uh, make use of bare metal servers. When we are directly interacting with hardware, um, to a certain degree, we don't have some of the flexibility that you would have with things like virtual machines and, uh, and other platforms like serverless. And that really is um, you know, kind of the reasons why things like Tinkerbell actually exist. Um, so, you know, kind of stepping forward, um, you can buy infrastructure from a myriad of different places. You can go to, you know, things like Amazon, um, buy a Raspberry Pi, um, or if you are looking at building, you know, kind of a, a large scale platform, uh, you would typically go to, you know, kind of one of the tier one server vendors, uh, and you typically buy something like what's in front of us at the moment, which is, um, an enterprise grade rack mount server, uh, bear, uh, rack mount server. Uh, with all the redundancy features, so like numerous power supplies in case one fails, um, a number of fans for cooling, etc. Um, I first bought a rack mount server when I was a university student, and I didn't know what one was at the time. Um, <laughs> and I was in I was in shared accommodation, so I, there was a number of people all in all in the same house as me. Uh, and this rack mount server actually turned up, uh, which I thought was brilliant until the first point when I turned it on. Um, <laughs> these things are not designed that these rack mount servers are not typically designed for kind of home usage. The fans in them to keep them, uh, cool are the loudest things, uh, you, you can kind of come across. Um, it took us a long while to find somewhere in the house where we could kind of have this running without, with still allowing people to actually get to sleep at night. Um, but that you know that's that's the that's how enterprise servers work you know they they run at full speed they don't tend to ever kind of slow down uh you know those fans are there to ensure that the servers always remain cool um dependent on kind of the workloads that are actually running on them which then generates a fair amount of heat if you're keeping that in a uh, in a house also i had a uh, <laughs> much much in the same at, at university we had uh, several machines in the same room uh, running at full load and so uh, was way in the north, way in the north of uh, Michigan, and so yeah, it was it was very warm in the winter. But that was we were using the waste heat as uh, as functional heat. 
Nice. That's uh, that's certainly one way of uh, keeping the house warm during the colder months of the year. Um, but yeah, these things are very loud. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, you know, kind of moving forward, um, you know, most companies who are wanting to run, uh, you know, kind of their larger scale applications are going to have more than one uh, physical server um, for not just things like redundancy, but also things like scaling. So the ideal plan and, you know, kind of these are marketing images is that you'll have a beautifully crisp and clean data center um, with all of these servers kind of all cleanly racked and powered and, you know, kind of redundant networking, redundant power and things like that. Um, in a lot of data centers, however, you'll find that it looks something like this. Uh, things <laughs> tend to organically grow over time. Um, somebody wants to kind of quickly plug one thing into another. Um, uh, but anyway, I digress. I, I have seen data centers that look like this and it's, uh, it can get pretty unple unpleasant. And I suppose on the data center front, we didn't uh, mention, but oftentimes these are yours. This is your data center, but uh, data centers certainly exist and services certainly exist that allow you to, instead of paying uh, $50,000, a quarter million dollars to take in, uh, lease those entire, entire servers by the hour. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. A, a lot of time, as you say, um, the the owners of bare metal servers typically will tend to be uh, one organization or one company who need to buy a, a stack of resource in order to do whatever it is that they're doing. Um, and, and that kind of leads us on kind of nicely as to, you know, why, why would they opt for bare metal? Um, why, why would they want to deploy directly onto servers when things like virtual machines are actually available? Um, there's a number of kind of key reasons, uh, but you know, kind of most things are, are really down to kind of types of workload. Um, there are there are a number of, of workloads that people may want to deploy um, where they will typically get the uh, not only the best bang for their buck, but also the best typical behavior uh, of their application or the best typical performance. So, um, uh, you know, kind of removing layers and being as close to the physical hardware as possible uh, is, is definitely a benefit where you have systems that have kind of high latency. Um, if for whatever reason, something on the system, a hypervisor or other virtual machines that are sharing the same hardware um, become things like noisy neighbors, that may cause applications to fail or ultimately skip beats um, because they're not getting the full access to to all of that hardware. Uh, and it's the same sort of thing for uh, clustering technologies um, and even things like real-time operating systems as well, uh, where um, full access to the hardware and ensuring that there is nothing else uh, that can stand between the path of code running and the actual hardware um, itself. Um, next kind of steps from that really are uh, the flexibility to do whatever it is that you want to do with your, your infrastructure. Um, running um, some hypervisors on there um, may limit your options in terms of the sorts of things that you can actually run within those virtual machines. Um, also, if you have a requirement for things like custom hardware, uh, FPGAs, uh, some other uh, embedded devices that maybe do... Um, things like number generation or do uh, some level of GPU or uh, AI machine learning requirements, things like that. Um, again, the flexibility of being able to build uh, hardware and have that in close symbi symbiosis with the operating system. Um, you know, that's kind of the flexibility that some people need, which again would drive them into a requirement of using uh, bare metal servers. And then finally, you know, as I mentioned, bang for your book. Um, dependent on your use case, then there is definitely increased value of opting for bare metal servers. If your uh, workload is typically in line with the available capacity of the server, as in, you know, your application requires, you know, 20 CPUs to run um, and 128 gigs of RAM, then uh, having a hypervisor sit there uh, is relatively redundant. It's a, a pointless layer um, that you don't really need. Um, 
and that layer that you add can basically incur cost from ops perspective. You will now need an expert in that level of virtualization to manage both that um, and you will also kind of get efficiency reductions in that you've kind of got this layer sat there burning a few extra CPU cycles uh, for no real benefit. Um, and then there's also uh, Garrett, you know, cost savings from no licenses being required or alternatively, you know, the guaranteed performance in that there is nothing sitting between your application and the, the hardware itself. So kind of finally, what, you know, what are the main use cases that we tend to see for uh, bare metal servers? Um, dedicated processing um, and things that perhaps require custom hardware. So as, a, as I mentioned, GPUs, um, offload cards, those sorts of things for video processing or signal processing, things like that. Uh, financial applications with uh, real-time processing that is guaranteed. Um, the markets move very quickly. If there is something that slows your machine down and you perhaps miss something that happens in a financial market, um, I mean, I'm no expert in financial markets, but I presume that will that second or so could be millions or billions or trillions today. Um, you know, who knows? But you know, these are the way. You know, these are the things that happen these days. Um, high performance computing, kind of comparable to the financial applications, but again, um, you typically want nothing between your your what you want to compute and the compute that you're running it on. Um, Security and compliance requirements for dedicated hardware. Um, so again, no neighbors on there. You just want your one thing that's actually running on there. Uh, large no neighbors, data. and there's also being uh, being aware of where the physical device is located too. I think that's something that we um, lose a bit when uh, talking about cloud. Is that uh, cloud machines may be in a, uh, a region or zone, and so you can say that this machine is probably in uh, in North Carolina or in the Netherlands, but knowing um, where your uh, where your data actually exists or where your application is running um, is useful and sometimes legally required for uh, for various companies yeah absolutely um, being able to you know articulate um, the exact physical location of that server um, knowing exactly what network cables are going into the back of it what switches that traffic is going to um, that is definitely going to be um, requirements for especially for you know kind of uh, personnel uh, financial uh, and other secure data um, so there's definitely going to be requirements for those sorts of things um, and then kind of finally you know uh, maximum uh, value for for your investments so um, when you spend money on that infrastructure that piece of physical um, hardware ensuring that that uh, the things that you're running on there um, match when things are actually in line with the requirements so kind of as a, again as i mentioned uh, getting maximum bang for your book there so these are kind of some of the main reasons why people are um looking at kind of using uh, and deploying two bare metal servers uh one thing that we've not touched on here is edge um and this is definitely something that is uh starting to be talked about more and more um and what we're starting to see are devices like Raspberry Pis um, or small embedded compute that is shipped to remote locations um, or used in kind of small embedded areas. Uh, and you know, again, we want to be able to kind of make use of that. We want to be able to automate the usage uh, of those smaller bare metal devices as well. So uh, moving, moving on, um, this is kind of where we start to come to the crux uh, of, of kind of what we're talking about today. Um, there is a, a lot of requirements to make use of physical infrastructure. There are a number of reasons for why people actually want to do those sorts of things. Um, and really the kind of problem area and the problem space that we're talking about today is the deployment onto these physical devices. Um, as, I, as I mentioned uh, earlier, um, a lot of people have made uh, a fantastic use of being able to automate infrastructure with virtual machines. It's very simple, click a button, here's some infrastructure. Um, and a lot of people would really like to do that with bare metal. 
And up until recently, it's not been the easiest of um, platforms in order to kind of replicate that same behavior. Now, um, when a lot of people think about installing an operating system on a physical computer the first time, maybe it's just me, uh, but I always hark back to the days of old where um, if I wanted an operating system installing on a physical computer, it was a stack of floppy disks or a, a CD-ROM. Um, and I would basically need to sit in front of that computer, insert the medium, uh, the media to actually install that, um, and then sit there and wait for it to complete in order to um, use my, my computer with this operating system on there. Now that's fine when it's just me with my one computer that I'm running to, wanting to run uh, Windows 95 on. Um, that just simply does not scale. Um, you know, if, if somebody wanted a, a VM on one of the cloud providers and they clicked a button and somebody then had to run somewhere, get a CD off a shelf, uh, you know, kind of go through those manual steps, um, those services simply wouldn't work. Uh, and it's basically the, the same for bare metal. So what we really need is uh, a way of being able to automate the process, um, manage the process remotely. So, you know, people don't need to be sat next to the machines. They don't need physical access to the machines. Um, they need a way of basically having uh, these steps that are reproducible. So um, there's a number of technologies that are required in order to do this. Um, and I'm going to kind of step through uh, these technologies now. Um, when I first put some research together around this, I came across a very strange realization, which I, I will kind of go through now. But um, the first technology that typically is required in order to um, remotely provision a, a physical server, um, I'll cover now, but it was introduced uh, in 1993. Uh, so in 1993, um, President Bill Clinton uh, came into power. Um, the leader of the Medellin cartel was, uh, was, was killed. Um, <laughs> the internet looked like this, uh, which is not very pretty. Um, and DHCP was actually introduced as a standard. So DHCP, um, is a, effectively a way of applying, uh, configuration to a, a server that, that asks for a configuration, uh, remotely. So this basically means that a computer that has no con configuration, uh, when plugged into a network, can can ask for some level of networking configuration. Uh, fast forward five years, um, Bill Clinton was uh, kicked out of his seat as uh, president. The internet was slowly starting to resemble something um, that we. Uh, know a little bit more that, that resembles how we view it today. And the final kind of piece of the puzzle um, was uh, ratified, which is the Pixie specification. So yeah, my realization really is here is that all of the technologies that power a lot of the provisioning uh, was all done within Bill Clinton's presidency, uh, which seems very random, but no work has been done since. So what are these kind of technologies that kind of power these sorts of things? So as I mentioned, DHCP, um, defined in 1993, uh, and is used absolutely everywhere, um, is essentially a way of a device asking for networking configuration. Um, if you take your mobile device and connect it to any network, um, either the 5G, 4G networks, or to a wireless network, when you connect it to that wireless network, the first thing it will do is it will use DHCP in order to join um, that network, that wireless network that you've joined. Uh, the next technology is TFTP, which is Trivial File Transfer Protocol. This is a simple and insecure uh, method, very lightweight, uh, for a server that is on a network to download files uh, to itself. And then finally, the other technology, the final piece of the puzzle um, is the Pixie standard. And Pixie is essentially a way of um, starting a program um, that has been loaded over the network. So 
uh, we can kind of see how these three things all kind of hang together and we can kind of step through uh, what that actually looks like and we can also um, start a, a, a machine and see the steps that it actually run through as it, as it is powered on. So uh, let's kind of go through the boot flow. Um, so we're going to kind of go through this in a bit of detail. We'll go through kind of um, all of the steps that a server goes through when it is actually uh, powered on um, in order to kind of actually get an understanding of, of everything that's happening under the covers. So we have our enterprise uh, class server that is waiting for us to actually make use of. Um, and the main steps really are for the first, we will uh, apply power to the server. The server will complete its power on self test. So um, typically when a computer starts for the first time, it will basically check that all the components are up and running. And once it has done that, um, the BIOS, uh, the, the main kind of uh, initial compute, um, uh, the brains of the, the server when it's first turned on, will typically be configured to look somewhere for something to load. Um, most servers uh, and most computers and laptops and things like that typically will be configured to look at the first physical disk um, where they will start reading from the beginning of that disk where they will typically find the operating system. And that's how most things kind of uh, would actually work. However, um, what happens when there is nothing on that disk or what happens when the BIOS of that server is set to boot from the network, for instance. This is typically, um, you know, what would, what would actually happen um, in a bare metal environment for provisioning. It is also something that if you've ever seen on a laptop is usually very bad news because it typically means that your hard drive has died uh, and your computer is trying to look somewhere else for an operating system to load. So commiserations if you've ever unwittingly come across pixie booting. Um, I'm sorry, but your disk has sadly passed on at this point. So what's actually happening um, when a server is trying to, to boot uh, from the network? So um, in most cases with, with physical servers, they will be connected to a network, a physical network. A, a, a networking cable will be plugged into the back of it. and you, somebody, uh, the ops team or yourself, I suppose, um, will have put together a, a server that provides um, the, the functionalities that I talked about earlier. So uh, the server will provide DHCP. So it will provide networking capabilities um, for the network. It will provide TFTP um, so that clients can download files uh, from it. Uh, and it will host all of the components for Pixie as well. So what actually happens? Well, the server starts for the first time. Um, depending on the BIOS configuration, it may look at the first disk inside uh, the, the server and find nothing there. Or alternatively, it might be automatically set to boot from network, at which point the server will broadcast on the network. Um, I'm... Um, this MAC address, uh, does anybody have a configuration from me? Um, so before we step on, what is a MAC address? Um, a MAC address is a burnt in, so it typically, um, it can be changed, but by default, a unique uh, ID is built into the networking card that um, the cable is connected to. And it is the, typical way uh, with bare metal provisioning how we can identify a server so um, that mac address is the unique way of being of being able to identify a, a machine within a data center so as i mentioned this server will boot up um, it will say this is my mac address does anybody on this same network that i'm connected to have a configuration for me at which point the deployment server um, through DHCP uh, will be able to offer an IP address of, um, that it, it, it actually manages. So most DHCP servers will have a range uh, of addresses. So typically um, this deployment server may have uh, 255, uh, 254 uh, addresses. 
um, that it will allow other servers to use. And from that pool of addresses, it will give one out to a server that is asking for it. So here we can see our server that has started for the first time has been offered the address uh, .10. Um, once it's been given an offer, the, the server has to then request it um, again. This seems a bit strange, but um, this is typically the workflow of how DHCP works. An offer is given. Uh, a server can then look at that offer and say, I don't want that address for whatever reason. Um, under most circumstances, a server will take that offer and immediately go, that's fine. I would like to request that for myself. Um, once that server requests that, it's the final job of the DHCP server to basically acknowledge that this address is now yours. And I won't give that address now to anybody else up until the point of that uh, address expiring. Um, so what that typically means is that most IP address offers um, typically come with an expiration time. Uh, could be an hour, could be a day. Um, when that address expires, that same process has to occur again in that the server will go, I'll need a new IP address. Can I have an IP address? Here's the one I offer, etc. cetera. Uh, and this is how servers, um, smartphones, laptops, etc., cetera, uh, when connected to a network, will typically ask for an IP address. Um, that's how DHCP works. But is that lease renewed or refreshed so long as the IP is in use or is that constantly happening all the time? So once, uh, once, a, once an IP address has been acknowledged, um, unless the server releases it, so sends a message saying, I no longer require this IP address, the DHCP server can't give it out to anybody until it's timed out in its lease pool. So in the previous example, um, the dot 10 that was given by the deployment server to our new server, um, nothing then will happen about that IP address until our server says that it doesn't need it anymore or the deployment server realizes that address is now timed out um, and hasn't heard anything from the server that it gave it to prior. Okay. Um, that hasn't put an operating system on the server. Um, all that has done is just showed how DHCP works. So how do we get to the point where our deployment server is actually sending an operating system to that server? Well, that is done through DHCP options. So if we step back to um, the second phase of what's actually taking place, we can extend a DHCP server to send additional information so normally um, when you request a DHCP uh, lease, um, the main thing that you really care about is getting an IP address, which is a capability of being able to speak on the network. There are a number of other things that typically um, you may need. Um, and these are called DHCP options. So for instance, a gateway address, uh, which is DHCP option three, um, is very useful. If you need to go through a router to get access to the internet, then that's a piece of information that you need. Um, if we're wanting to do remote provisioning, um, two options that we typically need will be things like a boot server address and also a boot file name. So these are DHCP options 66 and 67 off the top of my head. Uh, these are additional bits of information that are sent over uh, as part of a DHCP request. Now, um, you may get these when you're connecting to a normal network on your smartphone. Um, they will be ignored because um, we're not trying to do any sort of provisioning sorts of things. When we boot um, a server with no operating system, those options suddenly become very important because they are the options that the server will need to make use of in order for provisioning to actually take place. So um, what, what will actually happen here is We've sent these additional bits of information as part of the DHCP lease over to this server. This server has gone, that IP address is fine. I acknowledge it, et cetera. Um, I don't have any operating system, but you've sent me the bits of information that are very relevant. So you've sent me the boot server and you've also sent me a file for me to download. 
at which point the server can use those bits of information to speak to the deployment server and download that initial pixie file. So with this point, um, we've, we've got a DHCP lease, which gives us an IP address on the network, but we also have that bit of additional information about what to do next. Uh, at which point we will now download um, that pre-boot um, pre file. And this is where the pixie bit kind of takes in. Um, we've downloaded that file and we will now instruct the CPU to actually load that and run that as kind of an operating system. This is the pre-boot environment. So um, the information we were given from the deployment server has given us some code to run. We now have that pixie code downloaded into memory on our blank server and it will start running that. At which point, um, we will need to ask for networking information again um, because we've now loaded into a new environment um, which is starting from fresh. Uh, we've lost the request that we did earlier. So we've lost that IP address. Inside this operating system, we need to do the same steps again. So you will typically find um, as part of this, there'll be a second DHCP request. But one additional thing is that the request will come with um, an additional label that it didn't have before. So the pixie code that is running will do that DHCP request, but it will also say this request is not coming from a completely blank server. It is now coming from this pixie environment that is now started. This means that the deployment server has a bit more information to go on. Um, so again, it knows the same MAC address. The MAC address of the physical infrastructure would, would never change. It's, it's burnt in to the server. So it may well give it the same IP address again. However, it will be able to inspect the fact that that pixie label is there and behave differently this time. Um, at which point we know the pixie environment has started because that label exists. We can now send installation instructions over. So, um, on the second round of the DHCP request, it will send a different file name. It will send the file name uh, of the installation that we actually want to take place. Um, in this simple example, um, all servers that basically try and connect to this deployment server will always be told the next boot file name that uh, we're sending to you is, is Ubuntu, this, this Ubuntu.ipixie script. Um, which the PXC code will download. Um, and it's a simple script. It will see um, these four lines and it will pass them. So quite simply what's happening here is our blank server is running the Pixie code in memory. It's downloaded a script which will tell it what to do, to do next. Um, it will tell it basically to download and run uh, the kernel, this init RAM disk, uh, pass any additional command line uh, flags uh, when it starts that. And once it's downloaded all of that to actually boot from the kernel. So once it has that uh, script downloaded, it will then download all of those files that it needs to actually make use of. And typically the installation will take place from that point. So with the handover of the, the Ubuntu kernel and the Ubuntu, Ubuntu init RAM disk, it now has enough components to actually start Ubuntu as an operating system loaded over the network. So um, a bit like Neo started from nothing. <laughs> we can basically, uh, if we knew it was Neo and Neo had a MAC address, we can basically uh, plug Neo in and upload Ubuntu into his brain over TFTP. Uh, and he has all of the bits that he needs uh, in order to uh, to run whatever it is that he needs to run. So um, that is uh, basically kind of a step-by-step -step approach in terms of what happens when we take a completely blank machine, plug it into a network that has um, a server on there that has all of those components um, and, and start that machine up and actually running. Now, as I mentioned uh, earlier, um, a lot of those components uh, are quite old. Um, as I mean, DHCP is from 1993. Uh, the Pixie um, 
technology is from 1998. It's quite hard uh, taking those uh, components as they are uh, and using them um, in any way that is how we would call cloud native today. Um, in most places um, that I've seen, that I've worked, it's typically been um, a lot of work for various members of ops teams to provide any level of automation. Um, a lot of what is required is custom scripting to generate uh, all of the config which maps this particular server to what needs to be installed. Um, and it's all based upon you know, kind of old uh, or legacy kind of software, as I mentioned, that, that is quite old. Uh, and even then, when you've gone down the route of um, you know, kind of taking these older uh, legacy bits of software, wrapping them with reams of bash script to generate configuration files, to start up various bits and, uh, and whatnot, um, it's still very hard to automate. Um, scaling uh, becomes very difficult. Um, you may need to modify some scripts which could break alternative uh, bits of infrastructure. Um, the age of some of these components means that it might be very hard to kind of upgrade uh, and, and take them to a point where you can scale them. Um, it's difficult to kind of hand them to other areas of the infrastructure. So uh, as in IT, as we slowly start to break down silos and hopefully make things more shared between various kind of lines of business and things like that. Um, it's very difficult in order to share that functionality with, with these, other, these other teams. Um, a lot of documentation and or training is typically required in order to understand what's going on. Um, and it might just be me, but I often find that documentation can be uh, lacking, uh, especially around things like this, um, uh, especially around these sorts of technologies. And then finally, um, you know, integrating these technologies as they are um, with kind of existing ecosystems can be quite difficult. So trying to put newer platforms on top, um, trying to use modern ways of automating, uh, trying to introduce them into more cloud native ways with that set of tooling um, is very difficult. And even when you've gone down that path, um, you may be in a position where you've really incurred a lot of technical debt. You've spent a lot of time writing uh, automation around these sorts of legacy tools, um, which you are going to really struggle to maintain kind of moving forward. So we've talked about what bare metal servers are. We've talked about why people are using bare metal servers. We've talked about the technologies that uh, you typically need to use um, to get things deployed onto those servers. Where does that kind of leave us today? Um, and that really is um, the real reason why kind of Tinkerbell has been um, open sourced uh, for people to actually use. Uh, all of the problems that I kind of covered today have more than likely been some problems um, that were tackled and incurred by you know, kind of various members of the engineering team inside Equinix Metal as they started to build you know, the, the packet slash Equinix Metal platform. Um, and as they've kind of slowly tackled uh, all of these problems one by one, it slowly led them to building uh, Tinkerbell as a project to basically fix most of the problems that I've actually talked about. Modernizing the deployment, um, automating uh, a lot of the steps or all of the steps that are actually required, um, creating an easy way for building ecosystem that sits on top of uh, this platform, meaning that more modern tooling, more modern platforms, more modern infrastructure can easily automate then and scale up and upgrade uh, and manage uh, bare metal infrastructure. So uh, that is why Tinkerbell exists, basically. It is the answer to all of your bare metal problems. Um, so, um, yeah, so I'll quickly kind of go through uh, Tinkerbell in uh, a bit of high-level detail. Actually, before I do that, um, one thing that I wanted to do was actually show uh, what happens when a server starts and, and what it actually looks like. So uh, I'll just kind of quickly do that, and then we'll... We will step through uh, step through Tinkerbell. 
Tinkerbell because it's the best, most powerful pixie? Uh, yes. Uh, it's actually, I believe the tagline was powered by pixie dust. Which and, uh, I thought was quite cute. From the, uh, from, the, from, the, from the children's book from 100 years ago, right? Not the, uh, not, <laughs> yes. not the, legit, not the litigious American media conglomerate. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quickly start a, a virtual machine. Um, this virtual machine has disks, etc. cetera, um, but nothing is installed on those disks. So the first thing that will happen is the BIOS will try and read from the disk. Uh, it will find nothing. The next step, the BIOS will try and boot from another source. Um, in theory, it will try and boot from the network at which point, point we'll be able to see it kind of go through those steps that I talked about. So what I'm going to quickly do is I'm going to start a virtual machine. Um, and then I'm just going to connect to it remotely and bring this over here so you can all see that. So um, we can see booting from hard disk failed because there's nothing there. There's no floppy drive. Uh, there is no CD-ROM to boot from. So the final step really is for this to try and boot from the network. We can see that it did a DHCP request where it was given uh, an IP address for the first interface. So it was given uh, 192.168.1.5. Uh, it was also given uh, an address for where it can download its boot file from. Uh, and then finally, uh, it was told to download the Pixie file. And then finally, the, the latter steps here is that it's downloaded, um, it's done another DHCP request where it got given a kernel uh, address, it got given an init RAM disk, and it has now actually started to run uh, a Linux operating system that is actually gonna do provisioning uh, on this machine. So that's, that's typically what it looks like. Um, as I say, on most kind of consumer devices, if you're seeing the Pixie start up on your laptop, um, that's not typically a good sign. Um, that typically means that uh, <laughs> your disk is now no longer working uh, and the host has got nothing better than trying to find something on the network to actually uh, download from. So that's what it looks like. Um, and those are the steps uh, that you would see as part of Pixie booting. Um, so uh, Tinkerbell, what is it? Uh, what are the components that it is actually used from? Um, I'm just gonna give you a high level overview of Tinkerbell. Um, mainly because uh, we're gonna do a, a more in-depth session of Tinkerbell, what Tinkerbell is, how you'd actually make use of it. So I'm gonna finish up today um, just by briefly kind of giving you an overview of what Tinkerbell is. So uh, Tinkerbell is a number of uh, components um, that are automatically deployed for you uh, as part of deploying Tinkerbell. Um, makes it much easier to deploy. Um, we have a Tinkerbell sandbox that has been put together for people uh, to use. Um, it makes use of Docker containers. So you basically will just start Tinkerbell. Um, the Docker engine will get all of the components for you and basically start everything all up for you as a full service. Um, and as I mentioned, there's a number of components that actually power uh, Tinkerbell as a whole. Um, the first one being the boots service. Um, the name kind of uh, almost speaks for itself. Uh, the boots microservice is effectively a reimagining of um, all of the components that are actually needed to remotely start a server. So boots is a re-implementation of DHCP in Go, uh, a re-implementation of TFTP in Go, um, it also does HTTP running as well in order to um, have somewhere for kernels and RAM disks to be downloaded from. Again, using Go means that it's all memory safe, so uh, it's more secure. It's less likely to be exploited through uh, memory issues and things like that. Uh, and it means it's very good, uh, very simple to run lightweight within a container. So when a, uh, a server actually boots um, and asks for an IP address, it is boots um, that we can configure um, in order to give out those IP addresses. OC is what boots is, will give to a server when it actually boots up. So um, as we went through those steps previously, 
Um, you do all of the DHCP requests, you get given an offer. Uh, Boots will also give the boot address and boot file name for a server to download what is called OC. An OC is a combination of Alpine Linux, which is a very lightweight Linux distribution, uh, and the Docker engine. And when a server starts, when a bare metal server starts for the first time with Tinkerbell, it will download uh, all of this from the TFTP information, and it will start this mini operating system in memory. So at this point, we've got Alpine Linux actually running on our bare metal server. The next step is actually Tinkerbell. Um, what that actually means is that um, once OC is actually running, it will then reach back to our Tinkerbell server and ask, okay, what do I need to do uh, and who am I? And it is the Tinkerbell server which will reply back with, uh, these are the steps that you need to run to be provisioned. Um, in most circumstances, uh, we would often find that um, my bare metal server would start, it would download OC, and it would ask, uh, who am I, what am I doing? Uh, and it would be given something like a, an install Ubuntu workflow. So OC would start, um, and it would basically pull all of the packages and, and data that is actually required to install Ubuntu, and it would then write that locally to the physical disks of the server itself. At which point, um, we've deployed an operating system to this physical server. We can either get to that new operating system in one of two ways. Um, if we reboot that physical machine, the first step will be to look at the physical disks, at which point it will find our newly written operating system, at which point it boots into Ubuntu that we asked for, and the job is done. Alternatively, it can make use of a technology called kegzec, which is kernel exec, where effectively, once the operating system has been written to the physical persistent disks, we do a kegzec, which will start the kernel on the persistent disk. So it could almost be considered as a fast reboot. Um, everything that was running is quickly thrown out of memory and we in memory pivot to our newly deployed operating system where we will start that kernel. It will then start the rest of the things on that newly deployed disk. Um, and the final part really of Tinkerbell um, is Hegel. Uh, what is Hegel? Um, Hegel is effectively a metadata service. Um, and what that means is that um, whatever workflow that you choose to write uh, and however you choose it to actually uh, deploy things, uh, it can always interrogate what's known as the metadata service. Um, why is that important? Some operating systems like CoreOS, um, newer versions of Ubuntu, uh, they can make use of things like cloud init, um, where effectively the same operating system is deployed everywhere it will use cloud in it to read from a metadata service. Um, and that, that bit of metadata is the unique configuration of that server. So what that means is that um, I can deploy the same Ubuntu on every bare metal server. However, when a server with a particular MAC address um, tries to uh, read from the metadata, it is given metadata that is specific to that server. So cloud in it will go, um, I, need, uh, I need to interrogate the metadata service. It will know to say, it's part of its cloud in it, this is your IP address, these are the packages that need to be installed, create these users, here is what is unique about you, and all of that is exposed through the metadata service. Um, and this is the sort of thing you'll find in most kind of cloud providers as well, um, that they you can give all of this unique configuration um, through an API that is then exposed through metadata to that server when it boots up. Um, and these are kind of the main components that power Tinkerbell. Um, and all of this basically provides a very more modern, uh, an API driven 
cloud-like or cloud-native environment for bare metal provisioning, which is identical or incredibly similar to what you would find um, from existing cloud providers. This is all open source. So if you want to run your own bare metal um, business, I suppose, uh, you can take this, buy a huge amount of servers, use Tinkerbell to provision them as and when needed. Um, you can write your own custom workflows to do whatever it is that you want to do, deploy your own operating systems, deploy packages within them. So you can write a workflow to deploy CentOS and then put Kubernetes on top of there and then even put your applications on there, whatever it is that you need to do. Um, the choice really is down to you. Um, so that is Tinkerbell. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, as, as was mentioned earlier, uh, there's a sandbox that can be looked over and experimented with. Um, you can stop by uh, tinkerbell.org, which has links to the uh, GitHub repo, more of the YouTube, um, into the Slack in case you'd like to talk with any of the, uh, uh, any of the team. Uh, the team meets regularly to uh, discuss uh, improvements and uh, where, to, where to go and what to do next. And we'll be more than happy to have, uh, have any, anyone that's watching join us. Excellent. Yep. Um, we have, uh, as you mentioned, we have the community meeting on, on Tuesdays. Um, we also have Tinkerbell proposals. Um, so if you have taken tick, Tinkerbell for a test drive, um, there is something that you feel is uh, missing or would be a great idea. Um, uh, the proposals way really is kind of a great way of quickly saying, this is my idea um, and letting us all as a, as a community uh, learn about it, learn about your kind of thoughts um, and kind of help maybe finally tune that proposal, uh, help you implement it, uh, those sorts of things. So, um, you know, we've kind of been working hard to get all of that in place uh, for everybody. Excellent. Well, that'll be it for now. And we will see you again the next time. Thank you.